Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7. So this is going to be the first of six episodes that we do looking at the official guide to solo a Star Wars story written by the illustrious Pablo Hidalgo of Lucasfilm and the Story Group. And it's divided up into six chapters, so it kind of makes it easy to go six on the episodes. But we're going to talk about the introduction as well, along with Mean Streets, which is the first of six chapters within the book. And what I'm going to be doing over these next few episodes is cherry-picking, basically, stuff that I think is particularly interesting for Star Wars fans. And so we will talk about seven elements from that particular chapter that we're talking about that day that you may find especially fascinating. At least I certainly did, and I'm hoping you will too. All right, so item one has to do with Han's timelines. Now, way back in the day, Bob Iger had said that this movie was going to take place for, you know, a six-year period where Han would be traveling from 18 to 24 years old, and it didn't turn out that way. Instead, it's a three-year period, and he's running between the ages of 19 and 22, and this is somewhat of an approximation because Pablo Hidalgo puts a date in there and says it's the approximate date of Han's birth. They don't actually set it in stone, which is a really interesting choice, but yeah, there you go. But what we do know for sure is that the events of the Kessel Run, the famous record-breaking Kessel Run, happened nine years after the events of Revenge of the Sith. Not necessarily exactly, not on the anniversary or anything like that, just it's nine years later and that's when the Kessel Run happens. So that means that it's six years after the Empire has come into power, that Han and Kira try to escape Corellia, and only Han is successful, and then he has to join the Imperial Navy. So it's six years after the rise of the Empire that that happens. And we are also told that Han was approximately eight years old when he came into the employ of the White Worms and became a scum rat for them. Item number two has to do with Kira's timeline. So we don't know a lot of Kira's backstory, just that she's part of the White Worms, but we do find out that she is 18 years old at the time of their attempt to leave Corellia, Han and Kira's attempt to leave Corellia together, and so that would make her one year younger than Han himself. All right, here's thing three. So you know the patrol trooper, basically the Imperial traffic cop that ends up chasing Han, Kira, and Moloch as they're flying around the Corellian spaceport, or at least the outskirts thereof? Well, it turns out that that guy's uniform is actually very similar to scout trooper uniforms. So they're sort of the urban equivalent, at least as far as the flexible uniform goes. I don't know that they are necessarily as specialized as the scout troopers. I believe they are more like commando legs, so I have a feeling they have a much more intense skill set by comparison. But the armor itself is actually very similar, and that goes right down to their weapon of choice, which is the EC-17 Holdout Blaster, which is the same exact one that you saw scout troopers using against our heroes in Return of the Jedi. Now, thing four has to do with the pair of dice. So, there has been a change to what the story used to be. The story used to be that Han won the Falcon in a game of Sabacc, but in a Corellian Spike variation game of Sabacc, and it seems that that is no longer the case. These dice, which were supposed to be the dice that he had used to win the Falcon, not so much. While they are a good luck charm, that is to be sure, and they were used for Corellian Spike, but no, not the dice that were at all related to the winning of the Falcon from Lando by Han. Thing five is a reference to Corsec, C-O-R capital S-E-C, and I had a moment where I thought we were bringing some stuff from Legend into the canon here, but that's actually the Corellian Security Forces, which I guess that's also, you know, being brought into the canon from Legends, but I was thinking it was the Corporate Sector Authority, but that actually turns out to be referred to as Corpsec from time to time, C-O-R-P, SEC, but probably more commonly CSA for Corporate Sector Authority, and the policemen thereof and policewomen are referred to as ESPOs back in the Legends stuff. So, you know, nice to bring Corsac in, and we're going to talk more about bringing Legends stuff in momentarily. And then our sixth thing has to do with Lead Transport Security Officer Falthina Charest. 
That is the woman who Han and Kira try to make a deal with with the Coaxium in order to get past the customs security gate. Well, according to the official guide to Solo A Star Wars Story, the Imperials have been ramping up their hours and not ramping up their pay commensurately. And so Falthina has been looking for ways to supplement her income, which is exactly why she's open to the kind of bribe that Han and Kira are proposing with that little vial of coaxium. And the last thing I want to flag for you is there's a relief sculpture inside Coronet Spaceport and we go really deep on this one. So if you remember something called the Star Wars Adventure Journal, it was basically a book that was produced by West End Games, and there were a number of them actually produced by West End Games as part of the Star Wars role-playing game back in the 90s. So there's a reference to someone in there that comes from Adventure Journal number 8. And funnily enough, that cover, the cover of that thing is... Very, I think it's basically the same as a, a old school Lucasfilm holiday card. It's got Yoda with a pack over his back dressed as Santa. But here we go. We're going to try this. So the relief sculpture depicts the unknown forest of the Uhui Aral Koenig. Koenig? Koenig? It's like, almost like Koenig, like Walter Koenig from Star Trek, right? Sort of like that. The translation of that is the Trickster King in Ancient Corellian. And there's a whole rabbit hole that you could go down with all that stuff, but it's kind of neat to have that being brought into the canon again from Legends. So once again, we have an instance where this incredible treasure trove of material is slowly being integrated back into the canon in ways that... You know, when you go back and think about how Paulo Hidalgo had talked about the idea of, oh, gee, you know, we could possibly get back to a cleaner canon at some point if we just, you know, TNT everything and then start reevaluating bit by bit and being more careful about making sure that the continuities don't uh, contradict each other, that sort of thing. Well, it looks like the that is continuing. It's a continuing process and they're using every opportunity, including ones like Solo, A Star Wars Story, you know, not just to tell this one particular story, but also to integrate threads of all sorts of other little stories into the broader fabric. And that is going to do it for the top takeaways from Section 1, Mean Streets, as part of the DK Solo A Star Wars Story Official Guide. And thank you again to the folks at DK for sending me a copy to check out. I really appreciate it. That's going to do it for this portion of the podcast, except over on the audio version at sw7x7.com slash iTunes or wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can catch Last Jedi Trivia over there. For now, though, it just remains for me to say thank you so much for watching, and may the Force be with you wherever in the world you may be.